Hey everyone, welcome back. We are looking at a rescue related topic today and um, the items in choice we're looking at, kind of a personal favourite of mine, I love this stuff and I'm certainly going to enjoy talking about it and demonstrating some of these things in the video here. We're looking at building anchors uh, for rescue applications but in this case using pitons or otherwise known as pins um, to do that. This is something that is still not widely used or understood within the rescue community in general. And certainly in my travels, working around Australia and overseas, it's not at all common to see rescue agencies using pitons to build anchors. Probably a few reasons for that. They, it's a fairly obscure piece of gear. Once upon a time, totally standard in climbing now, uh, virtually no one who climbs has any real understanding of using pitons either as climbing protection or certainly as anchors. Anyone who aid climbs still and does big wall type climbing would understand this stuff but beyond that no one's really got a clue about it. So, so it's kind of obscure which is a shame because we can build very secure anchors if we understand how to use and place and remove pitons appropriately. So that's what this video is uh, all about. We're going to look at some of the gear here and then we're going to go outside of the field and show you just how to do it. All right, so let's have a look at what's on the table, shall we? Okay, so in terms of who makes pitons, there are a few companies around the world that have make, been making these things for a long time. They're all quite reputable. They're all very similar in design. The ones we've got here in front of us though are the current range of black diamond pins. I tend to be a big fan of these. And that's pretty much exclusively what I have. Of course, many years ago, black diamond started out as Chenard equipment. Most of the pitons you see in front of you here are in fact Chenard ones. Uh, and many of these I have quite literally had for the last 40 years. So I bought them when I was a teenager and I'm still using them now. It says a lot about how resilient they are uh, and how we can use them over and over and they just basically tend to last forever. There are three predominant types of pins or pitons. Let's have a look at what they are. The first one in here, okay, is the classic angle pin. These are made of chrome moly steel and it's a very flexible or elastic type of metal and it means that the design shape with the angle where it's a folded or bent section of flat there makes them really springy and they grip incredibly well when they're hammered in. So it's that folded or bent angular shape and the fact that they're made of springy chrome moly steel makes them bite or hold really well in the rock uh, but likewise makes them very durable so we can remove them and use them over and over again. So these ones are angle pins. The ones we've got in the middle here, these are incredibly flat very tapered pins and they, there are two different names for these. The size one and size two in here are called knife blades and then three through six, there's six different sizes, are bugaboos and they're named after a mountain range, okay? So knife blades and bugaboos, they're quite uh, unique in that they have this 90 degree angle feature on the striking end there and of course there are two holes. There's a hole in the flat section here and then another hole in the angulated or bent over bit here. That's so that we can place them into corner type features and still be able to clip the pin. So a very narrow corner placement, we put it in like this and we can clip that angle pin. So they've got two holes. And then these guys down here, uh, these are called lost arrows. Of course, the lost arrow is a granite spire feature in Yosemite Valley. It's just the right of Yosemite Falls as you look up at it and it's quite an amazing looking feature. So these guys are named after that, Lost Arrows. They're a forged steel pin, okay, and they tend to be a much fatter wedge type shape with a single eye in these ones, okay, so Lost Arrows. So how are we going to place a pin? Well, we're going to drive it in with a hammer, obviously. They can be hand placed, sometimes in aid climbing that happens. If we're building anchors for rescue work, we're not hand placing anything with these. We're gonna be driving them in with a hammer. You could kind of use pretty much any type of hammer, but if you're gonna do this well, you really need to use the right equipment. And that is a proper piton hammer like this one here. This is the black diamond hammer. Again, it's been around for years. 
They're still available right now. I've had this one for a long time. Uh, it's a wooden hickory handle on there underneath all the tape. Um, and the feature to be aware of on the head is the hole through the back of the head. We're gonna see what that's for when we go outdoors. Uh, it's used for removing pins. And then there's a pointed uh, end on the back end of the hammer here that we can use in climbing for augmenting placements and all sorts of different things in there. But we're really worried about the striking face and the hole in the head just there. Of course, I've got a leash on this guy here in a carabiner so that I can clip that. And when I'm out climbing or doing whatever, I can hang that on my harness. Uh, for when we're moving around or accessing a rescue site or whatever. Uh, and then the other mysterious bit of equipment that we're going to use here is this short wire strop with a swaged loop on each end and these two sacrificial carabiners. This thing is called a Funkmas device. Seriously, that's what it's called, okay? It's simply a short wire strop and we use two carabiners that you are never ever going to use for anything else. So these are my dedicated Funkmas beaners and we use this thing here for removing pins that we can't simply remove by loosening with a hammer and then uh, finger removing or hand removing, okay? So this is our ultimate tool for getting them out. And we're going to look at how that works when we go outside. Alrighty, so there's our gear, angles, knife blades and bugaboos and lost arrows, our pin hammer and our funkness device. Let's go outside now and have a look at how this works. Okay. All right, so we're gonna build an anchor just here. We've got this little corner feature just here. And what I'm gonna do is build a three point anchor. So I'm gonna use three different pitons to tie together into a focused uh, redundant anchor. I'm gonna use one each of the three different styles. So I remember a moment ago, we looked at knife blades or bugaboos, the really thin bladed type ones. Lost arrows, which are the short, thick, stubby looking pitons, and then the angles, which are quite different to the other two. I'm going to use one each of those three types to build an anchor just in here. Then we're going to pull it together with some 8mm cord, and there's our anchor, okay? The first one I'm going to place is this blade just here. I'm going to put the blade up in this feature under this flake just up in here. I'm going to start ha hammering on that in a moment. Just a, a point here in terms of the training area we're using. This is not a climbing site or anything. This is not a route that climbers would typically work on. It's an artificially enhanced road cutting effectively. And of course, this thing down here is a drill hole from when this was blasted however many decades ago. So we're, do so we're doing our demo here and working in an area which is not a dedicated climbing route because the reality is we place pitons. Even if you're quite good at it, ultimately it's gonna mark up and, and change the rock. So don't go hammering these things in the first time you get them into someone's climbing route because you're going to piss a lot of people off, okay? So here we go. Let's have a look at our blade. I'm going to turn the, the second eye of the blade up because that's the only way it'll go. And typically with pins, we want to be able to hand place them maybe a third, sometimes up to a half of their depth or the length of the shank or the blade into the feature before you start hitting it. If you've only barely got the tip of the pin in, and you start wailing on it with a hammer, it's not gonna go in. It's just gonna basically go dead and you're gonna blow the rock up. So we literally wanna get the thing in a reasonable distance, in like so. I can square it up and I'm gonna start hitting it. And of course, the thing to keep uh, an ear out for here is the rising tone. It's one of the best indicators we have of a good piton or pin when we're placing them, is as we hammer it in, the blade or shank length as it gets shorter, the tone of the metal gets higher. So we should hear a rising tone. So let's have a look. There's that very definite rising tone as the blade or the pin gets shorter as it goes in. I'm going to stop there. I can feel that it's making this flake slightly start to move. I don't want to carve the flake off. And it's, that's solid where that is now. Okay, I don't want to overdrive it because it's just going to bottom out the pin. It could blow the flake off and I'll just have to start again and leave a huge hole in the rock. Uh, as I mentioned in the outset, typically when people are using pitons, what they do is they habitually overdrive them. They figure if I just keep wailing on it with this hammer, it's just going to get stronger and stronger. It's totally not the way to go. You just need to get them tight and solid, and that's it. If you overdrive them, something's going to blow up, or they just fall out, basically, and they don't work. 
with our rising tone on a pin, you should hear that tone going up if the tone suddenly drops off and goes flat. So we get a sort of ding, 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 bonk like that. It means the pin has bottomed out or something's changed and you're gonna to need to redo it. So there's our blade nicely seated in there. There's piton number one. Alrighty, so now we're gonna put our second pin or piton in. This one, I've got this little number one, little baby angle just here and I'm gonna place it just in here, there's a really nice little pod in the crack right in there, uh, in the back of this drill hole here. I'm gonna seat my little angle just in, and it's already going in a reasonable distance. It's gonna come up a little bit there. Making sure that I've got about a third of the pin already in, and the eye I've orientated this way, my whole anchor is gonna point that way. So I obviously wanna orientate the eye the correct way. If you can't, because of a rock feature, you can spin it the other way and kind of overclip it or tie it off, which is what we're gonna do in a moment with our third pin. So let's have a look at our little baby angle as I knock this one in. Here we go. And there we go, He's, I've managed to get that in right the way to the eye and I had a rising tone the whole way. Teeny little bit of movement there, I just had to uh, accommodate that as it moved around, but that one's good. It's perfectly set, um, I don't need to tie it off, I can clip it straight up with a carabiner. Excellent, all right, now we're gonna move on to our third one. All right, let's get our third piton in now. And this guy here, this is a lost arrow, so these are the sort of shorter, thicker, uh, more of a wedge, a genuine wedge shape, and they're, a, they're a, cut, a forged steel pin. I'm going to put this one in just up in here. I've got a nice start position in there. It's probably not going to go in all the way, so I'm going to live with that because there isn't anything else. I'm going to tie this guy off after I've got it in to an appropriate depth, okay? Again, the, the eye orientation, it'll be one way or the other. In this instance, it doesn't matter so much because I'm pretty much going to tie this off with a short uh, nylon webbing runner. So let's have a look at our, our lost arrow here. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. It feels like it'd probably go a bit further, but it's getting hella difficult to hit and I can feel how hard it is to get any traction in there. So what I don't want to do is weld that thing into the cliff face damage the pin and just blow the whole placement open. That's good, it's solid, but because it's sticking out so far, I can't clip the eye necessarily because it's gonna put a lever force and potentially lever the pin out. So what we are going to do is we're going to grab our nylon webbing runner loop, just a little runner like this. You can either get the sewn ones or you can just hand tie them, whatever you want. Uh, this 9 16th inch webbing or even the thinner stuff is perfect for this and I'm simply going to create a girth hitch there's nothing very amazing in how to make this work either a girth hitch or a clove hitch whatever you want either one is pretty much going to work I'm going to girth that over the pin and the idea being that I can push that in as close to the rock as possible Lock that girth hitch or clove hitch, whichever one you can get in there, in nice and tight. And of course, that's keeping the leverage on the piton down and we can use it and tie it in with the other two. So we're, what we're going to have a look at now is tying these three together to create our anchor. All right, so now we're going to pull our anchor together. What I've done here is taken my length of 8mm cord. It's a standard 10 meter length that we carry for 50 different applications and what have you. Um, and I'm just using basic cordelette uh, type concepts here to, to build an anchor. I've created a shorter loop because I didn't need all of my cords, so I've joined it back here with a figure eight bend. You'll see that in one of our other videos, why we do that, okay? Clip the cord through all three of the individual carabiners on the pitons, pull the three, or the two independent segments and all three parts down, and of course now I'm gonna draw those up work out my equalization. I want it pointing down that way like that, and then basically tie that off. So 
like so. There we go. Creating a focal point or power point, whatever you want to call it sort of thing, and then I can run my system off that there. So we've got a fixed and focused redundant multi-point anchor. In terms of how you go about doing the cord lay setup here, doubtless most of you are sitting there going, yep, and I can think of 20 other ways of doing that, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whether you use webbing, slings, runners, cord, it's all gonna work. Um, this is just a quick expedient way with our standard length of eight millimeter cord to quickly uh, tie together there to create a focused anchor. Okay, so, and there we go, a piton rescue anchor. Alrighty, so we're de-rigging our anchor. I've removed the cordelette material, in this case the 8mm cord. Carabiners are gone. Definitely don't leave carabiners on pins when you're hitting them. People do that. It's stupid because you're going to damage your carabiners. So you've got to strip everything out, okay? The only carabiners we're going to use in here, of course, are these two sacrificial ones here that we looked at earlier on the ends of our functness device. This is our little wire sling that we're going to use here for pulling our pins out. These are two carabiners that I've had forever and the only thing I ever use them for is this. They never end up anyplace else. You'll see why given what I'm going to do with it in a moment. This is why we need a proper piton hammer for placing and removing pins. It's got this mysterious hole in the head just here that we saw earlier and there's a very good reason for that. One end of my functness piton puller goes in there and the other end of the device goes into the pin in here. And I'm going to use that to create a, a, a dynamic impact remover for pulling these things out. I'm not going to use it straight up though, I wanted to see if I can get it out without that first. So with our blade pin here, I'm going to tap this guy, in this case side to side, and you can see it's starting to loosen up. Each time I do that it's just getting looser and looser. But very typically with blades, and the reason why I chose this one to show you this, uh, because blades are so narrow and it's a function of their surface area, even if they move, they still won't come out. They can be amazingly difficult to remove. Even if the thing is flopping left and right, it's astonishing. I could stand here for the next half an hour doing that and it probably still won't come out under finger tension. So what am I going to do? I'm going to need to use my functness device. So I'm going to clip into the hammer, clip into the pin. I'll have to clip there because I can't get that one. And then the way we're going to get this thing out is drawing the hammer in nice and close to the pin, like so, and you need to stand aside and look away if you're not wearing safety glasses. I'm not right now, so definitely don't be looking at this thing when you do this, okay? And then we're going to dynamically hit the pin like so, and the impact of the hammerhead statically hitting that on the wire cable is what's gonna pull this thing out, okay? So I'm just gonna get into position and we're gonna look at that now. Okay, so we've had a look at how to place our pitons and tie them together into an anchor in a natural setting where we have access to cracks and different features, which is of course that's how the pins are primarily designed to be used. But in a rescue type scenario, we might not have that luxury of being able to find any decent cracks anywhere, particularly if the rock formation is a slab uh, and there isn't readily anything that we can drive these things into. So. Of course, the solution to that is using a cordless lithium ion drill, an uh, impact or hammer type drill, uh, and using an SDS quad cutter drill bit like this one here. This is a 12 millimeter quad drill bit, okay? And we're going to place our piton, pitons into the rock and create an anchor where we want it. This is certainly a great way of saving time and effort so rather than a team spending hours looking around the landscape looking for somewhere to drive our pins in we can pick a dedicated spot and so we want our anchor right there we're going to drill holes and we're typically going to place either a number one or a number two baby angle into the drill hole in this case it's a 12 mil drill bit number two baby angle perfect we should be able to hand place about the first third of the pin and then we're going to drive it all the way in using our pin hammer, do that at least three times, if not more if you like, and then tie that whole thing together using our cordelette type system, okay? Um, anchors that are drilled holes with pitons hammered into them, they look as ugly as anything, okay? And don't be doing this anywhere 
that's a dedicated climbing area or somewhere where obviously this is going to impact on the local setting. If you're going to practice this, uh, go to somewhere where it's a, a man-made type road cutting or some area where it's appropriate and drill away to your heart's content and try it out. It's a fantastically fast, rapid and easy way to build an anchor using these things here. Because we've hammered the angles into a dedicated hole, you're probably going to need a functness device to get them back out again. Okay, So let's go back to the field now and have a quick look at what that exactly looks like. Alright, well there we have it, okay, using pitons both in natural crack type formations and also drilling our own, okay, to build an anchor where we want it. It's the type of technique that totally works, but if you're not familiar with this, you need to get the gear and go out and practice, okay. Um, placing pins well, particularly in natural crack formations, is something like any learned skill, you've got to do it to really get your head around it, okay. Um, so it's just a matter of getting out there and trying it out. If you have any sort of load cell uh, or uh, anchor testing type device, it's worth taking that out as well, placing some pins and then loading them up with the tester to see just what sort of results you're going to get. And then obviously practicing removing them. When you're working with pins, try as much as possible to wear safety glasses or any sort of eye protection because Small shards of metal can come off these things and likewise you can get rock and other material getting blown around by the hammer So you definitely need eye protection. Okay, and absolutely when you're using the functness device Stuff goes flying in all directions to so make sure you protect your eyes But like I say, it's fun using these things and if you've not used this system within your rescue procedures before you'll find that it definitely uh increases your scope to build anchors where you need them and where you want them, okay? So there we go, pitons being used as rescue anchors. Alrighty, we'll see you next time.